as you enter the True Crime Documentary Channel. I would like to introduce myself. My name is David Leo. During the course of today, I will be relating the terrifying story of the Inman family. It would be an understatement to say that the Inman household presented an excellent veneer of unity to the outer world. They attended church on a consistent basis, which allowed them to blend in well with their neighborhood. On the other hand, hidden behind this seeming normalcy were terrible truths that would start even the most intimate of acquaintances. The year 1983 was the beginning of everything, since it was inside the boundaries of their local church that William and Sandra Inman's paths crossed. By virtue of their parents' blessing, William, who is 18 years old, and Sandra, who is 16 years old, have entered into holy marriage. Having made their home in the unassuming community of Logan, which is located in Hawking County, Ohio, the couple gave off the impression of being the quintessential pious Christian family. During his time at the Sky of Faith Evangelical Church, William, also known as Bill, was able to successfully balance his employment in construction with his musical aspirations. While this was going on, Sandra was responsible for managing their domestic affairs. With the birth of their son, William Jr., in 1984, they appeared to have reached the pinnacle of happiness. Nevertheless, as time went on, the fractures that appeared to be there in their seemingly perfect existence began to spread. William Jr., who is now 17 years old, met Summer Cook, who was 15 years old, in church in 2001, a situation that was similar to the one that his parents had experienced. A bond developed, which eventually led to the couple getting married in 2004, when Summer was 18 years old. After being married, the newlyweds moved into the Inman family house, which is located in Logan, Ohio. They brought their newborn baby Alex with them. Bill's dreams to become a spiritual leader, on the other hand, drove him to transform his garage into a makeshift sanctuary in the year 2004. In spite of the suspicion of the residents, the number of events that took place in Bill's mysterious garage increased, attracting friends, neighbors, and others looking for peace and quiet. Due to the fact that Bill's religious activities caused the household to be under a great deal of financial hardship, the family decided to uproot their lives and move to Florida in the year 2006. During their time there, Bill and William Jr. each found work in the hotel building industry, while Sandra and Summer devoted their attention to caring for little Alex and maintaining the household. Nevertheless, their time spent in Florida was brief, and by 2008, the Inmans had relocated back to Ohio, where they had made their home in a rental property located in the countryside of Vinton. Upon their return, William and Summer became parents for the second time to a girl whom they named Kelly. This event marked the beginning of a new chapter in their lives. Another daughter, Eleanor, was born into the family in the year 2010, marking the continuation of the family's expansion. In spite of this, tensions were building up beneath the surface of the Inman household's apparent happiness, and the Inmans were beginning to feel suspicious of one another. Where are the dark truths that are hidden under the surface of their seemingly average appearance? I invite you to accompany me as we continue to dive further into the terrifying story of the Inman family, where the line between fanaticism and faith is blurred, and the truth continues to elude us. During her time as a young parent, Summer frequently sought out weekends away from home in order to rest and rejuvenate. During these difficult times, Bill and Sandra, who are known for their unwavering support, took on the responsibility of caring for their grandkids. During the weekends, they made the most of the time they had with their three grandkids, which turned into moments of ecstasy. During the spring of 2010, Bill Inman became the leader of the Skynia Faith Church after obtaining a pastor's license and calling himself the pastor of the church. A philanthropic organization known as Ranch of Mercy was formed by him and his wife with the intention of providing assistance to people who are without jobs and homeless. Although Bill had a lofty vision of building a huge residence for widows and orphans, there were not enough financial resources available to pursue this endeavor. A lottery mechanism was proposed by Bill as a solution to this problem. Each participant would be required to pay a ticket, and the money would be designated for the construction of the shelter. A house or $200,000 was given away as the top prize, in addition to 99 other substantial prizes. 
This lottery was brought to the attention of the community through various marketing and news outlets. In the beginning, Bill went door to door to market it, promising generous incentives and stating that any surplus monies would be given to those who were in need. He was successful in selling 100,000 tickets at a price of $10 each, so accumulating $1 million for the initiative. A date of September 2010 was chosen for the drawing. Nevertheless, the Inman family had a personal upheaval in the month of June in 2010. Summer made it clear that she is interested in getting a divorce from Will, her spouse of six years. After making a keynote in her personal diary, she ultimately made this declaration. I'm so tired of pleasing everyone. I'm exhausted. Don't I deserve happiness? Don't I deserve to love someone again and feel loved in return? I don't know if now is the right time, but I want to tell Will everything. I feel terrible. I think he deserves to know the truth. He should know that I don't want to be with him anymore. I want to be alone, to find myself and understand who I am. Right now, I'm just a slave running around and following orders. I love my children with all my heart. I wouldn't trade them for anything. I don't want them to grow up and see their mother just following orders. I don't know how we will react to all this. Maybe he'll get angry, try to take the children and run. Or maybe he'll start threatening me, hurt me, or worse. I think the children should see us both equally. I know Will's parents will turn against me and try to make me stay, but I know that won't change anything. Last night, Will asked me what I want, and I don't know. All I know is what I don't want. I don't want to be unhappy and feel trapped, but I couldn't tell him that, so I just sat there in silence. Every day, all I want to do is cry and sleep. Nothing more. I just don't know how to get out of this situation and make everything okay. Hopefully, when I make my next entry, I'll understand how to solve everything. The divorce was finalized by Summer, who left the Inman house, taking her son, both of her daughters, and her personal belongings with her. The home of Summer's parents served as a safe haven for them. Due to her desire to avoid severing the connection that existed between the children and their father, she allowed visits to take place with both their father and their grandparents. Summer began a romantic involvement with a man called Adam Peters in August of 2010, two months after the couple had severed their relationship. At the same time, she was able to find a job at a bank located in the downtown district of Logan, where she was assigned a cleaning position owing to the fact that she had a minimal educational background. The month of September arrived which was the period that had been planned for the house raffle that was being organized by the Inman family for the Ranch of Mercy. On the other hand, building on the prize house had not yet already begun. Although the months of September and October passed without any new developments, the raffle was never held, and there were no explanations presented for its absence. There was no indication that the organization was in a hurry to repay the attendees. Due to a significant amount of rent that had not been paid, the Inmans were informed on December 1, 2010, that they were had to evacuate the property that they had rented. In response, Summer, accompanied by Adam, went to the residence of the Inmans in order to get the remaining items that she had brought with her. On the other hand, her acceptance, along with Adam's, was rejected. This prompted Summer to report her situation to the authorities, saying that her ex-husband was threatening her and preventing her from retrieving her stuff. The refusal to allow Will and his parents to enter the house continued even after the police arrived. Will made the matter worse by threatening Adam and getting into a confrontation with a law enforcement officer. Will was the subject of Summer's legal lawsuit, which she filed after giving some thought to their interpersonal connection. Prior to being married, she remarked on its idyllic aspect, but after getting married, she bemoaned the drastic change that had occurred. According to the reports, Will's conduct grew oppressive and he asserted his authority over a variety of issues, including her nutrition, her obligations around the house, and even personal affairs. She was not allowed to sleep without his permission, and she was confined to their house. She was also denied access to her phone and keys. Will's online actions on associated websites, including posting improper photographs, were brought to light by Summer. Will's desire for a big family, his interest in polygamy, and his online activities were also disclosed. She exposed his threats of violence if she sought divorce and cited the odd disappearance of her cats, 
which he casually ascribed to their fleeing via an open window, a claim he made with a vious delight. She also mentioned the fact that he had threatened to hurt her if she moved forward with the divorce. In response to the claims made by Summer, Will provided his perspective on the matter. The fact that he took Summer's phone and keys away from her was a justification for his fear that she was cheating on him. When asked about the cats, he replied that he had to take them to a shelter because of their uncontrolled behavior, which caused damage to both the furnishings and the members of the family family. As a consequence of this, Will was subjected to a restraining order, which prevented him from contacting Summer. Additionally, he was subject to certain fines and probation. All of this was going on while the families were engaged in a bitter custody dispute with each other. Described as a potential danger to Alex, Kelly, and Eleanor, the Inmans filed a report with the police against Adam Peters. The Inmans saw Peters as a potential threat. Summer's life was tragically darkened by a terrible occurrence not long after it occurred. On the evening of March 22, 2011, Summer Inman, who was 25 years old at the time, was finishing up her shift at the bank. After the office closed, Summer completed her cleaning responsibilities. At around 11 o'clock at night, she went outside to get rid of the garbage. Prior to her departure, she had sent a text message to her partner, Adam, asking him to meet up after work. However, he did not come across her. The anxious Adam arrived at the bank around 11.30 o'clock in the evening. His search took him to an alley close to the trash, where he found Summer's personal belongings strewn across the ground. These included her phone, her keys, and a music player that was still playing with headphones nearby in the grass. He located her jacket in the vicinity. It was not long before Adam made contact with Summer's parents and informed them about the issue as well as Summer's disappearance. He emphasized how important it was to get in touch with the authorities. The parents initially contacted the bank, assuming that Summer could have stayed for extra work and lost her possessions. They believed that Summer might have been working at the bank. On the other hand, those in charge of security were not aware of her location. Following that, they notified the Logan Police Department to report Summer missing, highlighting the fact that she was normally timely and made just a few instances of staying late at work. As soon as the police arrived at the site where Summer's things were found, they were greeted by the testimonies of three witnesses who had witnessed her kidnapping from that particular place barely an hour earlier. Summer was seen by two women who were out running in the evening. They reported seeing Summer as she proceeded to dispose of the trash. There was a white Ford Crown Victoria that was driven by a blonde woman who drove up at that very moment. Two individuals who were wearing black bollock lovers exited from the car on their own. In spite of Summer's protests and cries for assistance, they took her by force and put her into the rear seat of the automobile. A bystander's effort to intercede was unsuccessful because the blonde driver used pepper spray to render him incapable of doing so, which compelled him to abandon his position. Very quickly, the automobile drove away from the location. After the event occurred, the two individuals who were running went straight to the nearest police station to file a report about it. Their testimony, on the other hand, was originally treated with suspicion by the police, who found their story odd and questioned its veracity, fearing that it may be a fiction that was made up. Following the filing of a missing person complaint by Summer Inman's parents, the police arrived at the location where she had been kidnapped within around one hour. Despite their early attempts, they were not successful in locating the 25-year-old who had gone missing. After the news of Summer Inman's kidnapping quickly spread over all of the local media channels, the community's attention was immediately drawn to the situation. An influx of locals from Logan, totaling in the hundreds, came together in a coordinated effort to find her. After three days had passed, the likelihood of discovering Summer in a secure and unharmed state became progressively less likely. Throughout this horrific period, her parents made every effort to keep optimism alive in spite of the ideas that filled them with despair. In the moments leading up to her disappearance, Summer Inman uploaded a picture to her Facebook page that included her, her new partner Adam, and her children. The photograph gave the impression that they were a happy family unit. Will Inman, who had access to Adam Peters' Facebook profile, was surprised to see that he still had him on his list of friends despite the fact that Adams Peters was Summer's current boyfriend. An important issue is raised by this update. 
Why would a husband want to become friends with his wife's new companion after this? In the backstory, it was revealed that Adam, a guy who was not currently employed in a steady position, had been recruited by the Inmans for a variety of home jobs a year earlier, in the spring of 2010. At that moment, Adam and Summer came into contact with one another and began to form a connection. Summer gradually showed her devotion for Adam, despite her initial hesitation to do so. This inner turmoil is reflected in the note she made in her diary. When I looked into his eyes, I realized that the devil had taken over me. I didn't listen to what God was telling me. I tried to stop. My mind screamed, run. Get out of here now. But instead, I stayed and let him embrace me, and then delve deeper. I am very sorry about this. I am guilty. The events that transpired during this meeting marked the beginning of Summer's existence inside the Inman household. In her pursuit of joy and love, she launched the divorce processes, which dragged on for a considerable amount of time. It was five days before Will vanished that he disputed the proposed spousal support per kid monthly, requesting that it be reduced to $50, considering that his annual wages were just $6,000. Will and his parents submitted a petition to the court requesting complete custody of the children. However, the judge disagreed with their request. As a result of losing touch with their grandkids, Bill and Sandra saw a noticeable decline in their health, including a loss of weight and a visible indication of emotional distress. Those who knew them agreed that their grandchildren were the source of joy in their life. During the inquiry into Summer's disappearance, which took place in March 2011, the Inman family was found at the house of Bill's mother, who was 70 years old at the time. This residence was located in Jackson County, Ohio. The three individuals, Bill, Sandra, and Will, jointly stated that they were unaware of Summer's supposed kidnapping. It was on the night of Summer's kidnapping that they were traveling to Cleveland to look at a new property, according to the account that they provided. However, after three hours on the road, they experienced problems with their vehicle, which resulted in an odyssey of repairing their vehicle by the side of the road overnight before they returned to Logan the next morning when they arrived. They insisted that their encounters with Summer were mostly friendly, with only a few disagreements occurring throughout those conversations. However, they found that Adam Peter's job in their home was responsible for a change in the peace that existed among their family, and they described this era as being difficult. The trio continually depicted Adam as a negative influence, stating that he was the cause for the breakdown of their family, which had previously been peaceful, devoted, and tightly connected. When law enforcement officers discovered a white Ford Crown Victoria parked at the property of the Inman family, the case took a significant and pivotal turn. Following the examination of the car, a GPS receiver was taken away from the owner. Following further investigation, it was discovered that this vehicle was in the Logan area on March 22nd, the day that Summer was kidnapped. At 5.30 in the afternoon, the GPS was turned off, reactivated the following morning in Logan, which contradicts the Inman's assertion that they traveled to Cleveland the evening and reactivated the following morning in Logan. The fact that all three members of the family were present in Logan on both the 22nd and the 23rd of March was further supported by the phone records. After further investigation, it was discovered that the Inmans were at a vehicle wash on the morning of March 23rd at around 7.30am, participating in a complete gamut cleaning. While the interior of the vehicle was being cleaned, Bill, Sandra, and Will were all there to see the process. Summer, on the other hand, was noticeably absent. They went to an auto shop in Cleveland to get their tires changed after they had finished washing their vehicle. One of the employees at the shop made a remark about how unusual it was that Bill chose to replace his practically new tires with worn ones. He explained his decision by saying that he just did not like his present tires. A further piece of evidence suggested that the Inmans had made an effort to alter the look of the automobile. It is important to note that Bill had removed the police spotlight that had been fixed on the door of the driver's side, near to the side mirror. The three individuals, Bill, Sandra, and Will Inman, were taken into custody and brought in for questioning. Prior to their arrest, Bill gave his elderly mother the assurance that they were innocent, claiming that the scenario was a test from the devil before they were arrested. Throughout the course of the interrogation, 
The three individuals repeatedly said that they were neither aware of Summer Inman's kidnapping nor the name of the person who kidnapped her. However, after a number of hours and being confronted with the prospect of being sentenced to death in the event of a conviction, Sandra Inman's determination began to waver. Eventually, she gave in and admitted the truth about the situation. Sandra said that they were the ones who were responsible for the kidnapping of Summer on the evening of March 22 that took place. During the time when Bill and Will were wearing black masks, she acknowledged that the first plot, which she had devised, was nothing more than to kidnap and terrorize Summer. Nevertheless, she admitted that the events had evolved in a manner that was both unexpected and unfortunate. Will allegedly confined Summer by placing plastic ties over her neck, hands, and feet when she was forcibly placed in the back seat of the automobile. The purpose of this restraint was to intimidate Summer into allowing him access to their children. As stated in Sandra's confession, Will came to the realization that Summer was on the verge of losing consciousness as the situation continued to deteriorate. He frantically sought for a knife in an effort to free her, and he yelled to his mother, Oh my God, Mom, where is the knife? I can't find it. In an effort to get his mother's attention, in the middle of their widespread anxiety and frantic hunt for the knife, the precarious situation became even more complicated. In an unfortunate turn of events, Summer stopped breathing and passed dead. Sandra insisted that their intention was never to take Summer's life. Rather, they were only looking for a solution to their custody issue and hoping to guarantee that they would have continued opportunities to spend time with their grandkids. Sandra Inman revealed the hidden location of the body on March 29, 2011, which was one week after the kidnapping that had taken place. Near Nelsonville, on the premises of Skynia Faith Church, some 30 kilometers away from her place of employment, Summer's bones were discovered buried in a well that was contained within a septic tank. There was a special meaning to the church for Bill Inman because it was the location where he and Sandra had tied the knot 28 years ago. Bill Inman had been engaged in the construction of the church. Throughout their time at this church, the Inmans had been frequent attendees, and Bill had been a member of the instrumental ensemble. In order to expose the well, the cops had to first remove a concrete slab and then detach six bolts that were attached to the metal top. It was immediately upon opening that they came face to face with Summer's legs. She had been thrown into the septic tank while still wearing her work clothes. She had been thrown upside down. The humorous phrase that was printed on Summer's black t-shirt read, I don't have anger issues. I have issues with idiots. The forensic analysis showed that Summer had died as a result of being strangled. In addition to the obvious markings that were found on her neck, hands, and legs, which indicated that she had been confined, no other injuries were discovered on her corpse, which highlights the nature of the circumstances that led to her unfortunate death. Sandra revealed that her first intention was to dispose of the body by throwing it into a river. However, she subsequently changed her mind and decided that it would be more prudent to put it in the well that is located adjacent to the church. She believed that this would be a location where it would most likely not be discovered. She stated that she was experiencing a great deal of shame as a result of her acts and the irrevocable repercussions that they brought about. During the ensuing trial, Bill Inman, who was 49 years old, and Will Inman, who was 28 years old, did not admit any culpability for Summer's death. They stayed completely silent during the proceedings, expressing no evident emotions and avoiding making eye contact with Summer's devastated parents. They did not show any signs of emotion throughout the whole process. On the other hand, Sandra Inman, who was 47 years old at the time, was the only member of the family who admitted that she was responsible for the unfortunate events. Despite her constant assertions, she insisted that the plan to scare Summer was entirely her own creation. During a heartfelt moment just prior to the sentence, Sandra, who was overcome with emotions, confronted Summer's parents and begged them to forgive her. A distinct feeling of sorrow was communicated through her remarks despite the fact that it was muddied by her emotional condition and tears. Sandra remarked that she considered Summer to be her daughter and bemoaned the fact that if she had the opportunity, she would unquestionably change her disastrous mistake. When the conviction was handed out in 2012, all three members of the Inman family were found guilty of the charges against them.
Bill and Will Inman were given sentences of life in prison without the chance of parole, while Sandra Inman was given a sentence of life in prison with the possibility of release after she had served 15 years. On the other hand, there was doubt regarding Sandra's position as the mastermind behind the crime among their close friends and other church members who were aware with the patriarchal dynamics that existed inside the family. Bill held the dominating position in the family, and he generally had the ultimate say in any subject. This was a fact that was publicly accepted with widespread acceptance. Will, on the other hand, was thought of as a youngster who was spoiled and whose parents made sure that his every whim was granted. Those who were close to the family felt that Sandra's confession and admission of culpability were intentional measures to limit the potential legal implications that may be imposed on her husband and son. The children Alex, Kelly and Alan are still being brought up by the family of Summer, who later passed away. They were unable to provide the grandkids with an explanation on the whereabouts of their mother, father, grandmother and grandpa for a considerable amount of time. Should you find this narrative to be intriguing, kindly click the like button on the video and subscribe to the channel. Also, don't forget to leave your feedback in the comments section down below. The individual in question was David Leo. Have a good time in the following video.